Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray and I teach watercolor and today we are doing our C-Class tutorial. Hello. We have Keenan here working the camera. Hello, thank you for coming today. Thank you for coming today. And thank you for coming today. We will be doing this project in four steps. So our very first step is we're gonna tape our paper and just sketch the overall shape that we want to put our C-Class in. Uh, step number two, is we will paint our larger sea glass pieces. Step number three is we'll be putting in a little bit of a darker value or shadow on that sea glass to give it some dimension. And our very last step is putting in some small little pieces to kind of tighten up our composition. So that's it. Uh, we will be using three colors for this project. So our very first color is sea blue. Our second color is deep yellow. And our third color is red. Feel free to use whatever colors you have at home. This is our in-house paint brand, Dandelion Paint Company. Um, these are liquid watercolors, which means they're dye-based, which means they're vibrant, but they uh, fade in direct sunlight. So use that knowledge to whatever, to your needs. Okay. Uh, we're going to do our oath, and then I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about paint to water ratio, okay? So just give you guys a heads up. If you don't need that extra help, you can just fast forward the tutorial, but I know that it's something that we really struggle with when we're starting watercolor, so I wanna be very, um, let's talk about it. Cognizant. Yes, thank you. Welcome. So if you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. And I love to start that way with the tutorial because I feel like it's just a reminder of you to like breathe and reset. Like we are here to learn and grow and play and take chances and experiment. We are not here to compare ourselves. We are not here to be better than anyone else. We are not here to um, like define our value in the artistic world by how well this painting turns out. That's not what this is about, okay? So let go of all of that stress and expectations and anxiety and just be here to create and see what you make. That's it, it's just a piece of paper. Okay. So I am using um, just a round six today for this tutorial. We're just using one paintbrush. I also am gonna demo our Aguash brush, which is our bonus item for our subscription box for maintaining balance. So I'll show you guys how to use both of those. Um, and as I was thinking about this project and how to do it, we're basically just using light and medium values. Now values is all about the lightness and darkness of a color and doesn't really have too much to do about the color itself. Color, the correct term for color is hue and the lightness and darkness is value, okay? Now, what's interesting about watercolor is in order to get a lighter value, all you have to do is make your paint more transparent because then the white of the paper will show through and that's why it reads as a lighter value. The white paper is essentially your white paint. Whereas with acrylic or oil painting, if you wanna mix a lighter color, you take white paint and you take whatever color and you mix it together and that's how you get a lighter value. But with watercolor, all of that actually happens inside your paintbrush, depending on how much water and paint that you pick up. So when you're first starting out, it can be really overwhelming about if you know how much water and how much paint you should have on your brush, okay? So a while ago, I taught a tutorial and I said something in it that I don't think is totally correct. I was trying to explain water to paint ratios and I basically said, think about this entire belly as 100%. And then if you want a light value, you do 75% water and 25% paint and then like 50-50, so on and so forth. But then as I was, and you can see here all my notes and explorations, as I was thinking about it and thinking of like really slowing down about what I was doing, that's not necessarily true. Because when it comes to watercolor, you should have a constant amount of water in your brush in order to just make your brush 
paint smoothly. So the control, if you were to think of this as like a science experiment, the control is the water. The, the, the amount of water is constant. The variable is the amount of paint that you pick up within that water. So I'm gonna do a couple demos here. So I kinda wanna show you what happens in your brush visually on your paper because we can't totally see it. So in watercolor, when you put paint in an area of water, that color evenly spreads for the most part within that water. And the same thing is true for your paintbrush. So let's say that you have water in your paintbrush. Pretend this is your paintbrush, okay? And it's just water. And then you pick up a little bit of paint and you put that water in there it's just gonna like spread out in that water and see how light that value is? I mean, you can barely see that. And let's say you have water in your brush and you go to pick up paint. So this is your brush. I'm sorry if this is confusing, but I'm really thinking about this here. And you pick up more paint and you drop that paint in there. It's just gonna evenly spread out, okay? It's gonna move across that water evenly and get a medium value. So here we have a light value. I mean, that's a barely there color. Here we have a medium value. And then our last one, we got our water in our brush and I'm picking up a lot of paint and I'm dropping it in there. And it's just gonna spread across that water. And that's a dark value. So all of these things happen in our brush when we pick up color. And we don't see it until we actually make the marks with our paintbrush. So you can be like, I don't know how much paint I'm picking up, I can't tell. That's totally understandable. So what I wanna point out to you that I think has helped me a ton and I didn't totally realize it until I was actually doing this exercise is I love my butcher tray palette because it gives me a lot of room to mix. Like I feel like I have a lot of control. I realize that it also allows me a lot of control in terms of how much color I can pick up with my paintbrush. Because when you're working in these wells here like when you dip your paintbrush in it's kind of hard to tell how much paint you're picking up because it's all right here where when i have it on my butcher tray palette when i want to pick up just a little bit of color i know just to barely touch the edge of my puddle here because then i'm like oh i'm only picking up this much and then i can kind of visually see i want more paint or i want all of the paint and get a really dark value where with these cubbies here, I have a really hard time knowing how much paint I'm picking up because it stays all together at the bottom. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So not only do I like my butcher tray palette because I'm able to mix to my heart's content, but I can actually visually see how much paint I'm picking up because it's like flat. You know what I mean? Like there's a range. Yeah, this is a really cool way to explain this. So it, it's been super helpful as I'm trying to understand how much paint I want to pick up because I can actually see it. So the, the biggest thing that I want you guys to take away from this is that sometimes when we think of lighter values, we think more water. So we have a lot of water on our paintbrush. But when you paint with watercolor, what you don't want is a puddle for the most part. You don't want like, let me show you, like this and then like, you drop it and it's just like, if you were to like pick it up, it would like drip everywhere. That's just not a lot of control. So you see how it kind of like mm -hmm. is moving around. and dripping. In some paintings, that's okay. And some, sometimes we want to break the rules, but if you really want control over the values that you have, you it's more about um, how much water you have. And I'm, I'm sorry if this is, let me know if what I'm saying is just confusing because I really want this to be clear. But basically, if we were to break this down into steps, your step one is making sure you have the correct amount of water on your brush. That is step one. And it's the same for all three values if we were to break it up into values. So basically, when I'm picking up water on my brush, I'm dipping my paintbrush in the water and I'm hitting it off the side of the cup. What I don't want is you see how when it's full of water, my bristles are spread apart and it's dripping. Can you see that? Like maybe go to the side cam. If you bring it over to the left, down next to where the, uh, yeah, there you go. 
So if I'm picking up just straight water, you see it's dripping. You see my bristles are kind of spread out with the amount of water. That's too much water, okay? So when that happens, I always hit my brush off the side of the cup and it gets rid of that excess water. So now this is a good amount. I can tell that my brush is wet so I would get a smooth line and I still have my shape of my bristles. They're not like bulging with water and paint, mm. okay? So this, so then when I go to paint a swatch and you can't see it, oh, you can see it because it's oh. there. There's a thin layer and that's good. Like that's the amount of brush that you want when you're really controlling your values, okay? So if I'm doing a light value, I'm picking up water, I'm hitting it off the side of the cup. So I still have my shape, but it's damp. I'm picking up just a little bit of paint from my palette and I can visually see, I'm just grabbing a little, little bit and then I'm painting a swatch. And there's a light value, okay? And let's say I wanna do a medium value. You're gonna rinse your brush because we're starting over. Pick up water, hit it off the side of the cup. It's damp and it still has its shape, but you see how there's that drip there? Mm -hmm. That might be a little bit too much, so hit it on your paper towel to get rid of that drip, okay? And then I'm just gonna pick up more paint. So I'm just gonna like take my bristles and touch more of that puddle of color. And now I have a medium value, okay? And going in for our darkest value, we're gonna start over, we're gonna rinse our brush, hit it off the side of the cup so it's still wet. I can see it's glistening, but I still have my shape. I have my point, and I'm going to be fully putting the, those bristles in that puddle, like picking up a ton of paint. And there's my dark value. Okay? Sweet. So when you're this is a lot of information and you don't have to think about all of this when you go to create because um, you will eventually get to a point where this all happens naturally. It, like I really had to like stop and pay attention to what I was really doing and write it down to like even explain this to you because it all just happened in one step in my mind. So if you're feeling overwhelmed where you're just like, wait a second, <laughs> like what the heck is happening? I can't remember all of this and try and paint this picture. Take this information, set it to the side and then just paint and play, okay? Because the more that you paint, the more it's gonna become like you're, you'll recognize it while you're doing it and you'll get a feel for it. So, um, and even when I say like paint in dark value and I try and get thin lines, like I know that I've done this in other tutorials specifically when we're trying to do thin lines with the dark value. If you pick up too much water and paint, the same thing is gonna happen with your small paintbrush where it's bulging with paint and water. So sometimes you have to just like kind of get rid of the excess to allow you to still get that nice point on your on your um, small brush, okay? Mm. Now, um, what we're talking about here is specifically with liquid watercolors. The same is true for other types of watercolor paint, tube paint and cake, cake paints. But really what I want you to pay attention to here is the level of transparency because when we talk about values, that could just be like, that could be new language for us, so it's difficult for us to understand it. Really what I want you to look at is like, how clear is this paint? How well can you see through it? How well will you be able to layer it? When we work in light and medium values, it's easier to layer because the paint is transparent, so you'll be able to see those layers more, okay? And it's easier to work on top of them. When you start with dark values, they're not as transparent, which means that if you layer a medium value on top of that dark value, you're not really gonna be able to see it. Whereas if you layer a medium value on a light value, it will show up. So if it's easier for you to think about this instead of values, think of it as levels of transparency, then that could be a way that you approach this where it's easier for you to make these decisions, okay? Cool, I like that a lot. Okay, 
Um, the other thing that I want to point out to you guys is a paper towel can be a huge tool as you're, as you're learning, learning this and trying to figure out water to paint ratio. So if you're painting and you're noticing that you are, you keep getting like pools on your paper, maybe instead of just hitting your paintbrush off the side of the cup, you dab it on your paper towel as well. Cause when you touch paper towel to a wet surface, it absorbs. So you can lift pools of water off your paper using your paper towel, or before you even pick up paint, you can dab your paper towel. Okay. So, um, that's something that you guys can utilize. If you're looking at your work as a whole and you're noticing, wow, I paint really, really light, like I'm not getting a lot of darks, then I want you to challenge yourself to do these exercises where you practice getting dark values. Um, if you are looking at your work and it's all dark um, and there's not a lot of range, then I want you to challenge yourself to try doing light values and practice what that looks like. Because essentially how we create form or three dimensionality on a two dimensional surface is all about our values. I mean, if you think about a circle and a sphere, they're both the same shape, they're both round, but the circle is two dimensional. It's just a shape, it's flat, okay? When you look at a sphere, it feels like you can grab it. It feels like a ball. It feels three-dimensional. It feels like it's sitting on top of something and there's space around it. That is only because the amount, the values that are used on that sphere, the shape is exactly the same. And this is where art is super interesting because we can create the illusion of something that's three-dimensional on a two-dimensional surface. But the way to successfully do that is to be able to communicate our values and effectively communicating our values is effectively communicating form and depth within your painting. So if you're looking at your paintings and they just seem even in value, then you need to look, what am I missing? Am I not going to my darkest darks? Am I not doing my lightest lights? And as soon as you have that range, as soon as you have your highlights and your medium values and your dark values, you will have three dimensionality and you will have uh, depth in your painting. Okay, one more trick before we move on. <laughs> Keenan's just like, let's paint. <laughs> this is good information. Okay, you might, um, how do I say this? Being able to recognize values just by looking at them is a practice. But something that I have done, and I know this sounds so crazy, but it's worked for me and it's how I do it, is I squint my eyes and the different values automatically separate when I squint my eyes or unfocus my eyes. So if I'm looking at my, just my paper right here and I squint my eyes, this almost disappears. My light value almost disappears. My dark value sticks out and my medium value stays the same. You see how they kind of like separate? Does that? Yeah. Does that happen a little bit to you? Yeah, a little bit, like distance changes. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. kind of like things start to poke out more. So this is a helpful tool if you're looking at a picture and you're just like, I don't know which values are light and dark. I don't know. Unfocus and squint your eyes and look at that picture or that painting and the blacks are going to pop out. The, the highlights, depending on how light they are, they might pop out. Like they just start to... For me, I can define my values easier when I squint my eyes. And I don't know if that's like what everybody does, but that is my trick. So I, if I'm looking at a reference photo and I'm just like, wait a second, is that a medium value? Is that a shadow? Is that a light value? I squint my eyes and I look at it and it becomes more clear when I do that. I do the same things when I'm working on my paintings and I'm just like, is this flat? <laughs> like, is this all one value now and I've totally lost all of my form? I squint my eyes. And if they all, if it reads as even and there's no variation within those lights and darks, then I know that I don't have variation in value. But if I see them start to like sections poke out where I'm just like, oh yeah, that shadow underneath that cup is darker, I can tell then like I'm doing good and I got my different values. Okay. I don't know if that will work for you, but it works for me. There's also these things that I didn't know existed except for we have a quilting sister company, but um, they're like glasses that turn everything one color. Oh. And when you turn everything one color, it's very easy to see values. 
because it's monochromatic. So you can see the changes really easy because they're all one hue. So like if you uh, are a quilter and you happen to have those red glass, I think they use it for composition in their fabrics when they're coming up with what to quilt. So you can do that too if you want. That's cool. Yeah, turning something grayscale, turning something monochromatic will automatically, you'll be able to see those differences between those values. Or to save on postage, you can squint your eyes. <laughs> I've never heard if anybody else has done that, but it's literally what I do. So like, I hope it helps you. And I know it sounds so silly, but like, if you watch me paint, sometimes I'll be like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just know. So it's helpful for me. Maybe it's helpful for you. Um, okay, that was a lot of information, but I think we're ready to paint. Always. Always. <sighs> So I taped my paper down. I'm using Holbein soft tape. I'm using, I'm painting on the more texture side. Um, I'm going to take a pencil and roughly sketch my shape. Now you are free to do whatever shape you want. Originally I tried a circle. I just thought it was kind of boring. So I did a heart. Because who doesn't nice. love the sea, you know? Oh, love the sea. Sea glass. Oh, it's a heart. It's a heart. Uh, you know. I like that. But this is your painting. You guys can do whatever you want with this. So I'm gonna take my pencil and just lightly sketch a shape. And then fix it. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> the biggest thing for me actually with this was actually centering my heart. That was like the hardest Ooh, part for me. that would be tough. Yeah, I had to like seriously re-sketch this heart like five times. I have an idea. Yeah. You could use a ruler. Yeah. Measure it to the center, uh -huh. and then make three dots. Oh, is that what Nicole did for her Valentine heart? Yep. Smart. I don't think she used a ruler, but she used the three dot method. Well, um, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. I liked how you, as I was saying, you're like, uh-huh, using your hand to measure. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh, a ruler? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I got one of those. Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> And you can actually see here, um, like it's okay if your heart gets a little bit wonky. Like my left side was a little bit more round right here. And then on my right side was a little bit more narrow, but like let, it doesn't have to be perfect. Let it be whatever shape you want it to be. Yeah. Okay. And I'll put the center there. Boop, 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 boop. Sea glass is pretty amazing. It is, it really is. I don't fully understand it, but it is amazing. I've only seen it once. Really? Mm -hmm. I went to, when we went to like Monterey, not Monterey, um, Mendocino, there is sea glass beach. And so there's sea glass there, but it's such a bummer because so many people, you're not supposed to take sea glass from it, but so many people have taken sea glass from that beach that there's very little now. Oh. It's just tiny little pieces. Um, Why aren't you supposed to take it? Well, cause it's, it's like, the, it's it's like when you go into like a national park and you're not supposed to take things. It's like nature. It's like part of it. Oh. <laughs> Keenan knew oh. that the whole time. Yeah, no, I knew that. <laughs> yeah. I've been to a lot of national parks. <laughs> you should stop talking right now. <laughs> you legit can get in trouble. You're not supposed to do. And we don't do that. We don't take things from it. Um, well, and it was funny because my husband who... Um, just has a real respect for all living things, um, was so bummed at the amount of sea glass that was missing. And I was just like, well, there's not a sign. And he was just like, there is literally a sign right here oh, that says no. don't take the sea glass. And I was oh, like, no. oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Anyways, okay. I feel pretty good about that heart shape. Remember, this is low stakes here. You can make this whatever shape that you want. Yeah, this is like a flank steak rather than a ribeye or... Yes, exactly. You know, exactly, yeah. Keenan, you get it. I get it. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix a bunch of different colors on my palette so I can just pull from those when I do these sea glass shapes. Now, the colors that I'm going for are blue and green and, like, white. There, There is other colors of sea glass, but I feel like those are the most popular and recognizable, so that's what I went with. But I think there's, like, even red and... There's like some cool stuff. Cool. So I have my blue 
which is great. Love that blue. And I'm just going to use that. And then I'm going to make a little bit of green. So I'm going to take some of that blue and some yellow and make a green. And depending on how warm you want that green to be, you can add more yellow. So if you want it to be like a lime green, you're going to add more yellow. If you want it to read more turquoise green, um, then you're not going to add as much yellow into this mixture. And then I kind of want like a gray or white. So I'm going to take some of that green that I mixed right here and mix it with its complement red. And it's going to turn this kind of like desaturated, muddy, gray brown color. You see that? Yes. Okay. I'm going to grab a little bit of blue and add that to this mixture to give it kind of like a blue hint. And then I add water to it. So you see how I'm pulling water and I'm just touching the side. And if I have my scratch paper here, you can test these colors before you put them out, but this should be like almost gray, like a light gray. That's crazy. Right there. Yeah. So now well, that's I, a great color. Isn't that good? Yeah. Yeah. So now I have my like milky gray sea glass color. I have green and again, add water to it, pull. So basically, and I'm just going to narrate what I'm doing. I'm picking up water from my brush. I'm touching the edge of this. I'm not adding it directly in the center. I'm touching the edge because then I know just a little bit of paint, a little bit of color is going into that. And that is what I pull from. And now I have this light value. Let's do green. Ooh, that's a pretty color. That Hello. A... Maybe it needs a little bit more yellow for it to be like really green. There we go. Now I got my light values. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So now we're just going to paint our shapes. So I got my colors mixed. I have my round six and I'm just going to go for it. Now the really, really wonderful thing about sea glass is that it's all different shapes and sizes. But just remember that for the most part, it has softened edges. Keenan, will you look up how sea glass is made? Yes. And share with our viewers. So I'm just taking my six, making any kind of shape. Okay, and then I'm gonna move on next to it, another color. Sea glass begins as normal shards of broken glass mm -hmm. that are then persistently tumbled and ground until the sharp edges are smoothed and rounded. In this process, the glass loses its slick surface but gains a frosted appearance over many years. That's cool. That is cool. So, originally, when I was creating these projects for this box and I was thinking about balance, I wanted to do balance stones. Do you know what those are? Like rocks that you balance on top of each yes. other. And I did a couple variations of that project and I just, something just didn't feel right. <laughs> I don't know why. I just like, I just kept on thinking about sea glass and about how there are these opposing forces that when they're brought together, create something different. So I was thinking about glass and how sharp it is. And then when you mix it with the movement of the water and hitting over and over, how it softens it and turns it into these, this, this softer, milky, different thing. And I think that that's true. Um, like this idea of duality and having like you know, you can't experience joy without also knowing pain. You can't experience, you know, sun without also experiencing like dark, you know, like how and there when you put them together, they create something more. And does that make sense? Is that speaking to the balance theme? I don't yes. know. It just felt it just kept on calling to me and just in the back of my mind, I was just like, sea glass, sea glass. And I was just like, sea glass doesn't work with balance. You know, <laughs> balancing stones make more sense. But it just felt right. I don't know, just the idea of this hard and soft coming together um, to make something else. I, it, just, it just spoke to me in that moment. And maybe, maybe you guys at home who are painting this, you're like, yeah, I get that. Or maybe somewhere you're like, you should have painted the balancing stones. <laughs> What's just some balancing stones? 
<laughs> okay, so as you can see, I'm just starting to put shapes in. Um, I'm letting them be different sizes, different colors. I'm keeping them all within this light value. So remember, the amount of water that you pick up is constant. It really depends on how much paint you're picking up. That is what is gonna determine your lighter value. Now, in step three, which we haven't gotten to yet, but I wanna just tell you, there's two different ways that you can add a shadow onto this sea glass. Because what I'm trying to do is show that they're not like, paper thin. There's, there's a little bit of thickness to them, a little bit of dimensionality to them. So we just need to add a, a little bit of a shadow. So there's two ways you can do it. One is you can paint your shape and let it dry and then pick up a little bit more paint within that same color and add it later like so. This is called wet on dry. Okay. Or what you can do is you can paint your shape and then while it's still wet, pick up a little bit more paint and drop it in along the side. Now there's gonna be less control there. You see how it bleeds out? But it's gonna create more interesting colors and texture, or more interesting textures. So you guys can decide what works for you. I actually did a little bit of both in this one. So like some of them I dropped it in, you can see here. Like this one, I dropped the shadow in and it kind of bled out. This one was very clearly added while it was dry because it stays crisp. Mm. That line stays crisp. So this is where you get to exercise your artistic preference and make those decisions for what you like to do. Maybe you like one, maybe you like the other, maybe you like the mixture. There is no wrong answer here because it's your painting. It's your life. You can do whatever you want. Um... And when it comes to following the shape, I'm just kind of roughly following it. So I'm not like stressing too much about like, does this go all the way to the edge and doing like a line all the way to the edge? I looked up where sea glass beaches were. Yeah. And I found a thing called 10 best sea glass beaches. Ooh, okay. Two are in California. Mm-hmm. A third is in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. Really? Which shocked me. Okay. Um, Ireland Island, Bermuda. Oh, I'll go to Bermuda. That sounds great. Yeah, it sounds awesome. Uh, Seam County, Durham, UK. Devon, UK. Oh. Morocco. Oh, gotta go to Morocco. <laughs> I can't say this one. Okay. What if I was... Vladivostok? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be so cool if I was just like, hey, let's make art, people. I really need to study C class. What if we go to Morocco? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would go. I'm in. You're in? I'm in. Okinawa, Japan. Cool. And Melbourne, Australia. These are all places I would go to. Absolutely. Wisconsin probably is the easiest one to get to. You know, if, if you guys, uh, if some of you guys live in Wisconsin and see these beaches, yeah. let us know. Serious. If you've been there, I'll read the name of the beach. Okay. I just want to point out one thing really quick as you're painting this. I want you to be aware of the colors, the hues of these uh uh, sea glass that you're putting next to each other um, because you can create accidental implied lines within your composition and you can use that to your advantage for example maybe you wanted to do like a smaller heart within your heart and so you only do green ones along the outside and then like blue ones on the inside that are in the shape of the heart or maybe you want to do like a letter <gasps> that would be cute that would be really cute yeah so like play with that Play with that. If you want to do it on purpose, do it on purpose. If you want it to not create accidental implied line, just be aware of the spacing. It's okay if some of the colors end up next to each other, but don't do like eight in a row, all of the same color, because that will um, affect your composition. Yeah. Okay. As we're going with this, I'm going to show you guys how to use our bonus item. This is Ooh, our bonus item. Fun. So this is an aquash brush. And the cool thing about this is this is perfect for travel. So if you were to go to a sea glass beach and you wanted to paint sea glass right in person, I would take this guy. So basically what it is, is you twist off the lid here and you fill this compartment with water. So then you don't have to have a jar of water. Nice. And to get water in your bristles, you squeeze it. And I'm going to put it over here. 
If you squeeze too hard, you will get it leaking out of the top instead of going into your bristles. You see that? Yep. So you just want to be gentle, okay? And then you just pick up the color, whatever color you want, and you paint with it. Fun. So, and then if you want to like rinse your color, what you can do is you can squeeze more and just kind of like squeeze water onto it, rinse that out, grab a different color. Or if you have a jar of water, you can use a jar of water. Mm -hmm. um, but this is really great. I mean, I feel like we actually have a lot of lettering tutorials on how to use this Oshkosh brush because it's a wonderful way to bridge the gap between marker and paintbrush and watercolor. So if you're used to like lettering specifically and you're used to using brush pens, but you wanna like delve into watercolor, this is going to be your friend. And when I went on a um, trip to, I think I was doing some plain air painting, which we learned in our art history box. That means you're painting outside in person. These are really helpful to have um, because they already have water in them. So you don't have to carry a container of water with you. They're also really great for like doing washes and like urban sketching. Does that make sense? Because you can like do a wash and then take a pen and do like a building sketch over it or trees oh, or things like that, you know? Okay, yeah. So if you're really interested in painting outdoors, um, going somewhere and taking this with you, or maybe you just want to paint at your friend's house and you want to do this project, if you don't want to damage your paint brushes, if you don't have like a container or a paint roll for them, this aquash brush is like the perfect thing to just grab and go. Okay? Nice. So I'm going to paint with this for a bit. That beach in Wisconsin is called Grant Park Beach. Oh, Grant Park Beach. Anyone mm -hmm. been there? Okay, so now at this point, I'm going to go in and start putting some um, medium value. And I want to show you guys something on this too, just to be aware. I'm going to do this on my scrap paper. Your values need to speak to each other in a way that makes sense. And what I mean by that is if one, if you have one value and then you jump, if there's a huge gap between your next value, it can feel disconnected. So let's say this um, is my sea glass right here. Uh, actually, I'll do this one. Let's say this is my sea glass right here, this like nice, really gorgeous, desaturated blue. And I take a super dark value to act as my edge. That does not look like the edge of a sea glass. It looks like a bracket holding on to sea glass. It looks like something totally different from the actual object. So when you're adding your shadows to add a little bit of dimension to your sea glass, you wanna make sure you stay within a medium value because if you go in and add some dark values along the edge of, the, of this, it's gonna feel um, disjointed from the object that you're painting, okay? Okay. So I just wanna point that out. And that's true for like, um, and, uh, sorry thoughts so many so many thoughts so many thoughts at once that's going to be true when you guys start doing like your own portraits or your own paintings where you're kind of coming up with them from your own mind you're going to have to start looking at that because if i paint like a tree a certain value right there then whatever tree I paint next to it, they have to be related to each other in terms of value. So then the world that they exist in makes sense, like has the same rules and they relate to each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. But this is a great beginner step in showing you how it, it's important that your values speak to each other. Um, also, when I'm adding these values, these medium values for the shadow, I'm not going around the whole thing. I'm just doing like, half of it or the bottom of it or one edge of it. Because if you do the whole thing and outline it, it could like actually flatten it instead of making it feel like you see an edge of a three-dimensional thing. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I 
I kind of just want to like do one really dark just to show you guys. Can I do that? Do it. Okay, I'm going to do it on this one. The gray one? Yeah, let's do the gray one. No, 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 no. I'm going to do this green one. Okay. So I'm going to mix a dark green. Makes me think of mint gum. Totally. Or an earplug. Like. Oh, that's a finger. <laughs> It might not be, like, it just feels like, is that, is that a shadow? It feels it, disjointed. It, it feels does, like there's two things there. Yes. If you accidentally do that because you're still getting used to the water to paint ratio while it's still wet, just take your paper towel and pick up the excess paint, and that's going to lighten that value. Mm. Problem solved. Wow. Yeah. Look how different that looks. <laughs> yeah. Holy cow. <laughs> You know, a lot of people um, are kind of scared to try watercolor because it's a little bit more permanent than like acrylic or oil that you can just like keep layering and paint over. But there's actually a lot that you can do to adjust things in watercolor that it doesn't like ruin your painting. One of them is just adding water and lifting. Yeah. It does a lot. And a paper towel. Yeah. Okay. I need to get going on here. I'm just gonna start painting a little bit faster. Oh, two minute challenge? Yeah, do you wanna do that? I'll set a timer right now. Okay. So one thing that I'm gonna do since I know I'm gonna be painting fast is instead of going from color to color to color, I'm just gonna do like a bunch of green and then a bunch of blue and then a bunch of white, but not in one space. Okay? And go. Oh, that's a cool method. You, I know you said this out loud, but it didn't make <laughs> sense in my brain, and now it does. You're like, cool. And I was like, okay, I believe I you. Saw, I saw your face when I was saying it, and I'm that's like, why I, you'll get it when I start doing it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but I'm noticing that I'm making the same shapes around the same shapes. Mm. So I need a, I'm, I'm aware of it, so now I'm going to change it. So many decisions are being made. And remember, sea glass is gonna come in all different shapes. Some are, some are full on round. Some are like long and skinny. Like really, really don't stress too much about these shapes because I'm telling you, it exists somewhere. Mm. I mean, it's broken glass. Think of all of the different shapes that broken glass can come in. Yeah. Ooh. I didn't tell you the minute warning, so 51 second warning. <laughs> the other thing that you can do, and I just did that, is if you put a, a color down that's just too dark, when it's still wet like this, you can just lift the color out. Lift, tap, lift, tap. Now it's light. Do the same thing with my green, because my green got a little bit dark and it's still wet. Lift. seconds. <sighs> okay, I'm doing it. I need it. I did that. I did that. <laughs> and then while it's nice and wet on some of them, I'm just going to start adding this shadow. Now for me, and if you guys have been painting with me for a while, you know that I love a good bloom. You know that I love a surprise and an accidental element. So I'm a fan of kind of adding the, the medium value when it's damp and just seeing what it does. Now, some of these are actually already dry. That's fine, too. It's doing the same thing. I'm good. Where, if anywhere, would you, if you were daring enough, mm -hmm. sneak a purple in this? <gasps> a purple? A purple. <sighs> purple. My thought. Okay. With the shadow of the gray ones, it would look pretty cool. Mm. Okay, I can see that. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Okay, good. All right, I got to mix some more neutral because as you can see, I depleted my color. So I'm just going to grab some red, grab some green, 
grab a tiny bit of blue because I want this neutral to lean, if any color, I want it to lean more blue. I just feel like that speaks to the color palette that we have here. But neutrals can lean any color. Neutrals can lean yellow or purple, like Keenan was saying, green, blue. Like, So if you want to make a decision, you can like just grab a little extra of that color and add that to the mixture. Okay, I feel pretty good about that gray color. And again, I'm just using my six and going along the edge here. Boop. And we're on step three. And again, I'm just doing like one or two sides. I am not going around the whole thing. For me, I feel like it would flatten it. Should we try one and see? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do it. I think so. I'm gonna do it this one up here. Maybe it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't make it look as dimensional as the one shadow. I mean, it might flatten it a little bit, but I kind of like also that it's bleeding a little bit more. Yeah. Listen, this is your painting, you guys. If you're like, I like doing it all the way around, do it. Do it. Do Own it. it. All of it. It's your painting. You can do what you want. You don't gotta listen to me. Those are lyrics from several songs. Is it? No. I, just, oh. I mean, I'm sure that individually those words are in songs. Yeah. But I was trying to, I was trying to help you out. And you can even have fun with this. I don't know, like, if you wanted to do this with, like, pebbles instead of sea glass and make them, like, stones, you that can do that. That would be cool. And you can actually probably use some dry brush technique to get some different textures. Let's try it on one, just to see. Just to see. Yes, please. Okay, so if you're just like, what is a dry brush technique? Basically, you know how I talked about that you wanna have a certain amount of water in your paintbrush to get a smooth line? We purposely don't add a lot of water in our brush, so then we get a not smooth line, and that can add to our texture. So if you've like, probably one of my favorite ways that we've used it is if you've done the parrot tutorial, we use oh, the dry yeah. brush technique on the branch, and it makes it look really cool super cool so um i love using i've i think i've delved more into dry brush technique this last year than ever before and i'm totally in love with it so i have my brush i'm hitting it on my paper towel and not dipping it in the water on purpose so then i know it's dry dehydrated if you will and i'm going to pick up this gray color hit it on my paper towel just for extra and then i just go across the brush and see how it's like uneven a little bit uh, maybe it needs to be drier there we go that one's uneven mm. you see that and you yep. can get some really cool textures so if you guys are interested in like painting like stones or bricks or things like that um i would try that try that technique and see if that helps okay and i'm gonna lift this color that i put down on it i'm just showing you guys all my little tricks so many tricks in this one so I did the dry brush technique on this, which made it dark, which made it stand out in my composition. So I went ahead and just put water on that. I dried my brush off and I'm gonna lift the water out. And with that, the excess color. So now it's a smooth light value again. That's nice. Yeah. I do like the idea of stones. I can't stop thinking about stones now. Yeah. Dang, I wish I would have brought down the projects with me where I tried doing the balancing stones. Oh, yeah. um, it just wasn't, it wasn't speaking to me, you know? I'm sorry. But you guys can paint those. You guys can do that. It's probably because it was a, a painting of rocks. <laughs> so I wouldn't speak to you. <laughs> <laughs> Classic dad joke. <laughs> that was good, Keenan. That was a good dad joke. Oh, thank you. I've been okay. practicing for years. I feel, I feel pretty good about my sea glass. And now what I'm going to do is um, do my very last step, which is I'm going to do smaller pieces within these larger pieces. It's just going to tighten it up, and I think it's going to speak to the variation of sizes and glasses that you can get. Now, when pieces are smaller, 
they're a little bit harder to do that full range of value. That's also why painting small is like tricky because it's just such a smaller space to do different values. Um, so some of these are just like medium value, little pebble things and I think they turned out fine. So don't stress too much about having a full range or like a large range on these tiny ones that we're putting in here. If you feel like you can get that range though, like go for it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's nothing saying you can't. Yeah. This is your painting. You guys can decide what you can and cannot do. You don't got to listen to me. This looks super cool. You like it? Yeah. And just when you're adding these like smaller ones, just like um, try and spread them out. Where I'm just like, okay, this is looking good, but I feel like I need one over here. I feel like I need one down here. I feel like I need one up here. Um, and if you have trouble seeing that, then step away from your painting for a bit. Look at it from far away or take a picture of it. Usually when we do that, can I tell you why your paintings look better when you take a picture of them? Yes. Because you're taking, when you take a picture of something, it's taking the three-dimensional world, world and flattening it into a two-dimensional thing. That's why it's so much easier to paint off of reference photos as opposed to real life. That's why you can see your composition easier because it's taking this three-dimensional world that we're in and see and just going here, two-dimensional for you, there you go. And it's just so much easier to work off of that and then see the composition off of that because it does that like for you, that, that like here. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's the technical term. Were you looking for condense or flatten? I don't know if condense is the right word. It's almost like, a, it seems like a picture is your, also, your other, uh, your eye trick. Yeah. Where it removes things for you. Yeah. It's just like, I think it's easier for our brain to see it. Okay. But I haven't really looked too far into it, but that's just what I... And actually somebody, that's not my original idea. Just so you guys know, a lot of this I learned in school. <laughs> but I remember actually our teacher asked us like, why is it easier to use a reference photo? And this one guy raised his hand, he's like, because it makes it two dimensional from a three dimensional. And I was just like, whoa. And then I was like, you're the smartest person. <laughs> you just knew that? I would have never guessed that. <sighs> so cool, but it makes sense. It does make sense. And so like working, if you guys are starting to kind of do your own thing, working off a photo is easier. Um, but painting in person is so fun and like such a great challenge. So I recommend trying both and just seeing, seeing what works for you. Okay. How are we feeling? I feel like I need maybe a blue one right here. Yeah, this one needs a shadow. Boop. And I need one right here. There's my heart. Nice heart. We got it. Boom. And maybe, <laughs> all right, maybe I'm not dead. <laughs> maybe this guy needs, and I'm using my aquash for this. So you can, I'm just kind of using these interchangeably, but it's just great practice. I like these two because like the point you get on these brushes, let me show you. Like you can get the finest line. That is a good line. But you can also get like super thick. I mean, I guess it's very similar to a round six. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty, <laughs> it's like the same thing. It's just exciting. It's the travel factor that makes it really exciting. Yeah. I'm gonna put some shadows on that. Okay, now when this totally dries, um, which we don't have enough time in this tutorial, but what I would 
what I did, like especially with this original project, is when it was totally dry, I took just an eraser and erased my pencil marks from when I outlined the shape. Um, but this is such a fun project that you guys can customize. I really hope that some of you guys decide to do some of those like patterns within it and you know, like letters or I don't know, I don't know, play with it, make it yours, change up the colors, do pebbles instead. Like, but I really hope that you walk away from this with a, a little bit better understanding of the paint to water ratio on your paintbrush, how that informs your values and how those values need to interact with each other to build form. So, um, if you are in are on Facebook, you can join our watercolor group that's called Let's Make Art Watercolor. If you're on Instagram, you can tag us at Let's Go Make Art. We love, love, love to see what you make. It is so scary putting your art out there. It's a very, very vulnerable place to be, but know that we got your back, okay? Um, if you need any of these supplies, you can find them at letsmakeart.com. Thank you for painting with me and I'll see you guys next week.